Where'd I go? Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Okay, here. How about, okay. All right, we are starting. It's 5.30, welcome everybody. Um, we're gonna get going in just a few minutes, allow some participants to pop in. Just wait for a couple of minutes while we allow people to join us. My name is uh, Sarah Rasich. I'm um, with the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and I want to welcome you tonight to A Taste of Art um, for VMFA's Fridays After Five program sponsored by Chase. We want to be sure to thank our sponsor, Chase, for this wonderful opportunity to meet tonight with Hollis Kate, who is Director of Sales at Blue Mountain Brewery, joining us this evening. Um, so <laughs> Mariana's here from Argentina. Yay. Hi, Mariana. Um, just as we're getting going, um, and before we really dig into tonight's, um, program, I just want to remind some of you, uh, have already been to many tastes of art before, but just as a reminder, um, you guys can see us, but we cannot see you. So, um, but we're still very interested in, in uh, your impressions of the art and the beer as you taste it tonight. So we really wanna invite you to join us in your observations as, as Mariana has already done this evening. Um, so if you would kind of throughout the program, feel free to participate by, by simply clicking on the chat on the lower part of your screen. Um, both um, Hollis and myself can see the chat so we can uh, see what's going on. And to streamline things, we'll kind of answer as we see your questions we'll, or your observations, we'll kind of respond to them verbally instead of in the chat. So that's just a quick reminder of how that will work. And oh, my little thing is not working. Um, and so this morning, I mean, sorry, this evening, um, Hollis is here. He's going to give us a really nice taste of uh, Blue Mountain Brewery and some fantastic beers from um, their um, operation, three wonderful tasty beers. And I hope to give you a taste of a fabulous upcoming exhibition at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, which is opening February 6, um, Virginia Arcadia, the natural bridge in art. So. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Hollis, and have you start with the brewery and kind of get us familiar with that spot, your operation, and um, what you've got going on there. So I'm going to hey, hey. first slide up. Well, here. Uh, really excited to be a part of it. Uh, this is my my first time doing a uh, webinar with you guys. And I think we may have participated with you guys in some of the, the Fridays after five events uh, back in the past uh, in person, but I'm really excited to be. With you guys, I've been with Blue Mountain for um, what seven years now, working here in the restaurant. I've worked with on the brewing side, and now working in uh, sales and marketing, and um, just you know teaching people about our brewery. So um, I would imagine a lot of y'all are, are familiar with Blue Mountain. We opened up in 2007 uh, here, about 20 minutes west of Charlottesville, so probably about an hour and a half from uh, the heart of Richmond there. Um, and we've been uh, we've been rocking and rolling since then. So we have two locations now. Uh, one is in Acton, Virginia, uh, in the northern part of Nelson County. The other is in uh, just south of Lovingston, uh, on your way towards Lynchburg and Arrington, Virginia. That's our production facility, the Blue Mountain Barrel House. Um, so both locations are located uh, are in are in Nelson County. Uh, when we opened up in 2007, we were the first brewery to open Nelson, in Nelson County, and we've been. Um, I guess we've been here since uh, another 250 or so breweries have opened up since then. Uh, yeah. So it's been, it's been quite quite the wild ride for Virginia beer, but we've been excited to kind of be in on the ground level. Uh, right down the road from us would be Devil's Backbone and Old Rock and uh, Star Hill. It's in the area as well. A lot of kind of the, the original uh, brewers to, to 
to lead to the craft beer boom in Virginia, uh, out here in Nelson County. So Great. we love the area. It's uh, it's very rural, very beautiful, very much in touch with the agricultural side of brewing. Um, and it's, uh, it's, we just have great water, which is actually a big reason why a lot of the breweries opened up out here, uh, getting that, that mountain water to help make our beer. So um, yeah. I'm at the brewery now, and we are, uh, this is our, where our original spot when we first started with the brew pub. Um, and then on just on the other side of the door would be the whole restaurant. So every now and then some folks will pass through, whether to get kegs or, or something. So may see us in, in action here. So, awesome. um, but like, like Sarah said, please feel free to mention anything in the chat. Be happy to uh, answer questions or just have any, any sort of back and forth while we're uh, talking, about, talking about beer. So, um, yep, so just this is uh, a picture that, that I put on here just to kind of show you the setting where we are. Uh, it captures the restaurant as well as the kind of the mountains there in the background. Uh, we have a lot of good sunsets out here in Nelson County. Um, and while we do have, uh, we take a lot of pride in the beer we're making, we also have a really large restaurant. So we, uh, during the pandemic for the first uh, several months was, was difficult um, being just locked down and uh, relying on curbside business only. Uh, but since we've been able to open back up, we have a lot of outdoor seating and we've been able to uh, really um, and take advantage of and get a lot of folks out here on the patio. So even today when it's, I think we're about to drop into the lower 40s, if not upper 30s, we still have folks sitting outside, sitting around heaters and uh, enjoying a beer. So uh, very happy to be able to keep rocking and rolling. Yeah, for sure. Very uh, lucky location. Two locations. This is the view from our second location, the Blue Mountain Barrel House, which is further south in the in the in Nelson County. Uh, we opened up uh, this uh, five years after we opened the brew pub. Uh, so we continue to brew beer here where I am for the restaurant, but all of our beer for production that's going out into the world, the beers that you guys are sipping on tonight, uh, were brewed and packaged down at the Barrel House. Um, I actually don't have a picture of the Barrel House itself, but just the, the view that we have down there. Um, it's, we also have a restaurant there. It's a little bit smaller. Uh, we just uh, expanded the space there as well. So it's a little little further off the beaten path, but it's a really nice setting and a lot, lot more open, a little slower pace than what we have going on at the Blue Pub 151. But what a beautiful view. And you've got those, of course, the Blue Mountains there back there. You're, you're oh, yeah. The yeah. That's gorgeous. So um, just related to sort of the production, you mentioned sort of when the beers go out to the world. So where can people get your beers generally? I mean, are you, where are you distributing? Yes, we're all over. Um, we're all over the state of Virginia. Um, we, one time were distributed um, in 14 different states. Uh, we have since, uh, just with as many breweries that are, out, that are out there, we've really started to hone in and focus on just Virginia. Uh, uh, so you can get us from the, the coast all the way to, to the mountains, so to speak. And, um, you know, pretty much any store that is carrying beer is likely to have Blue Mountain. Of course, all the, the smaller bottle shops are going to have our largest portfolio, Wegmans, Total Wine will have pretty much everything we make. Uh, you can still find some of our most popular beers like Full Nelson uh, at Food Lion, Kroger. Um, mm -hmm. Depending on the store, some of them will have more selections than others. And then when, uh, when we get back to rocking and rolling in restaurants, you'll find us on draft, especially with some of our more experimental stuff. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of partners in uh, in the Richmond area that carried our beer on draft for a long yeah. time. So. That's awesome, great. So you're, you're statewide as is a BMFA. So it's <laughs> nice to have yeah. that. Yeah, all right. Just so. another picture from down there at the, at the Barrel House, um, really kind of tying in the, the idea of not just making beer, but being able to relax and enjoy it. Uh, a lot of our packaging and a lot of our naming and a lot of our, uh, just our whole beer experience is, is really built on Nelson County and the land um, and the atmosphere. So you'll even just uh, looking at the bottles you guys have with you, um, you'll just kind of see with the, the full Nelson or the Kolsch, um, really, you know, have kind of like a mountain range built into the bottle, so to speak, into the label. Uh, this road here is Route 151, which is the road that runs the length of Nelson County. Uh, you can see the same kind of Adirondack chairs that you see there. Um, that's a, actually a hop sitting in the middle of the chair there. So it's kind of just hanging out. I've got one on my hat. So we, we really, really enjoy being where we are. Um, and we're really, our, our brew pub here, uh, it's only, what was I think, like an hour and 20 minutes or something like that to, to Natural Bridge. So yeah, a lot of the, the same, same mountain range um, that, that runs through the area of Natural Bridge is the same one that, that we 
get to enjoy looking at even in that picture. Yeah, definitely share that, that fabulous mountain view. All right, let's see, I think we've got, yep. So speaking of the labels, I think we should invite people, if you haven't already, uh, to pop open your first beer. And Hollis is gonna introduce that Hollis, to us. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna, I've got my, my glass of it here as well. Um, so this, uh, we'll go ahead and, I'll go ahead and talk through the tasting and then, uh, then we'll talk about some art too. Yeah. But, uh, so the first beer here is our Kolsch 151. Um, this has become one of our most popular beers and really just our, I guess, our most, one of our most approachable beers in our lineup. Uh, we do have the beers in order of complexity um, this evening. So this is going to be our, like I said, most approachable beer. Um, a Kolsch is really a unique style. Uh, it is a, it's neither an ale nor a lager. It's actually both. So in brewing, one of the uh, main distinctions between different styles of beers, if it's an ale or a lager, which is determined by the type of yeast that you use, the yeast is what's going to um, consume the sugar in the, in the grains that give us the alcohol and the carbon dioxide that's in beer. Uh, and this, this particular beer uses, a, a, it's an ale strain of yeast, but fermented at lager temperatures. So you get kind of the fruitiness of the ale yeast with the crisp uh, finish of the lager yeast. Um, it's one of our, like I said, more approachable beers at 5%. I would say it's a lighter beer. I don't like to say light because it often implies a, um, you know, like a Miller Lite or a Bud Light type light mm -hmm. uh, or a, a light on calories. But I, I like to say it's more of a pale color, um, yeah, but still a very, uh, let me say, lighter, lighter finish to it. So. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Uh, oh, also a German style. I, think, I don't know if I mentioned that, but it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's a style that originated in Cologne, uh, or Cologne. Germany, which I think that ties into the art as well. It does, it does for yeah. sure. So bottoms up with the Kolsch folks, we're gonna turn to the art next. And um, as Hollis mentioned, yeah, so Germany. Um, I, I decided to pair um, the Kolsch starting with these two images. Um, these are two prints of Natural Bridge. Um, and just to, to introduce the bridge itself, I'm sure many of you know, um, especially um, maybe not Mariana because she's from Argentina, but many of you Virginian folks uh, may know of Natural Bridge. This is a, it's a limestone arch, a, a very distinct geological feature of the Shenandoah Valley um, near Lexington. So, so as Hollis noted, not too far from the brewery. and. Um, now, while the, while the arch has really stood in that location for thousands of years and, and actually is on land that is the ancestral land of um, native Virginians of the Monacan Nation, really its presence in art and in, in being depicted in, in um, art is, is really relatively very, very new to that long, long history. And the print that you're seeing on the left is looking at the bridge, um, looking northwest as you might approach the bridge. If you went today, some of you who have been there may recognize this as the view you see as you're coming kind of away from the visitor center at the bridge. And then the print on the right is from the other side. So you're looking um, back through where Cedar Creek, that creek that runs under the bridge and is sort of responsible for its formation is a little wider at that point. And, um, and uh, so as it says, the Kolsch has German roots. So, so too do these two prints. These are made by a German artist um, who was um, active in the US for, for quite some number of years and traveled around um, kind of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and um, of course, Virginia. So he comes to Virginia in um, 1853 and spends about four years here really documenting visually the entire state. So he's, he's making sketches and paintings of um, all over the Commonwealth, including Natural Bridge. These are two of three views that he makes, um, that he sketches. But then he goes back to Germany in 1857 and he has these sketches um, made into about 40 prints, um, 40 lithographs. And then, and these are 40 lithographs of views of Virginia. He comes back, um, to the United States, to Richmond, in fact, in 1858. And he copyrights these images and he packages them up and he sells them as folios entitled An Album of Virginia. And the museum has um, several of these prints in its collection. And these are two of three of those prints of Natural Bridge that appear in the show. 
And then um, I did want to bring in too, I was really intrigued when you were talking about the way this beer is made and sort of categorized, if you will, as kind of um, sort of a hybrid aspect to the, to the Kolsch. Um, and I wrote, you know, that it's an ale kind of treated like a lager. And I think one of the cool things about a really um, tight focused exhibition like this one is that you really can see or um, get a chance to see really the wide, wide way in which um, a single subject can be treated artistically. And I think visitors when they come to the show will really um, come to an understanding that though these are categorized as landscapes, they really have an air of portraiture to them. And in fact, you've got three here that are kind of in portrait mode. If I asked you to print them on your computer, you'd have to choose portrait mode. Um, and so you actually have where the Kolsch is, a, is an ale treated like an, a lager. You, in this case, have landscapes treated as portraiture. And um, if folks are willing, it'd be kind of interesting to hear, you know, if you were to look at these images by these three artists of the same place, um, what kind of personality you feel coming out in these portraitures? How would you sort of characterize the natural bridge, if you could, um, looking at these images? I don't know if Hollis, if you have any ideas about what you, yeah. you're you noticing. Well, it's when you first look at them, some of them almost look like the shapes of a, like of a, of a head, you know, <laughs> like just almost like they are portraits, like you said. Um, I think the one on the, the left, the flatter one, definitely has more of a, a stern um, look to it, you know, that flat, flat brow almost. Uh, whereas this, the middle one, I would say maybe like inspired or um, kind of a, uh, like excited in a thoughtful way. <laughs> so oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, and then the one on the right uh, seemed to me more of, I don't guess, wisdom being a personality trait or. Uh, I don't know, it has, it has a little more of a, a almost age look to it in a way that I would guess maybe say experience, but um, they almost kind of follow like an age pattern to me too. Like a, they, a yeah, a little bit. Oh, that's, child, yeah. Like a black head, no offense to anybody's children, but <laughs> a young yeah. child, but, and then maybe like a middle age. I don't know. That's, oh, that's, such an, that's such a cool way of looking at it too. And we've got Denise is, is you know, uh, characterizing the, the bridge as having a very commanding personality. <laughs> He's exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, I love this idea that it's that it's sort of, you know, on the left that you see that kind of, um, oh, and somebody's saying the Ma the McKenty version looks almost impressionistic. So that's the one on the left, the far left. The Shaw has the look of an old master and the Fisher looks like realistic art. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> Brenda is noticing that Hollis characterized them better than she ever could. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I mean, it's true, these artists, they have really just a distinct and different eye and what they choose to represent at the bridge is really different. I mean, Jervis McEntee, this, this is a piece on the left that is in the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts act own collection. And this was painted on site. So it has that real immediacy. Um, someone said it looks almost impressionistic. Um, I love this idea that the Flavius Just Josephus Fisher, the centerpiece has that wisdom to it, that it, that it seems a little bit more um, kind of important or has sort of a seriousness to it. Um, and, and that the Shaw is just much more delicate. Um, and yeah, it's very cool. I mean, I think, I think people, when they, when they come to the show or, or, um, sort of experience it more with the, with the other images in the show, um, it is really cool to see all the, the very different ways in which the bridge is shown. Um, so speaking of difference, let's move to a different beer. And Hollis, tell us a little bit about Full Nelson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is kind of the beer that got it all started. Uh, this was the very first beer we made back in 2007. Uh, this is uh, named after Nelson County. You've heard me say Nelson County several times. We're very proud of Nelson County. Um, it is uh, out here in, in Nelson. It's it, We are very rural. We probably have more uh, apple trees than, than residents and certainly more cows than that. So we only have one stoplight in the whole county. I think we're up to uh, five, six breweries, but, uh, two or three dozen wineries and two distilleries. Um, so we're very much about craft beverage out here, uh, but also getting to enjoy enjoy the landscape. So uh, Full Nelson 
is what we style as a Virginia pale ale. So not an American pale ale, not an India pale ale, but we, saw, we call it a Virginia pale ale. It's a style that we invented when we first opened up. Uh, it's a little stronger than your average American pale ale, which six, usually sits around 5%. Um, and it's hoppy, but not too bitter. Uh, and then a, an, an IPA or India pale ale uh, tends to be over 6% and a little bit more bitter than Full Nelson. Um, but Full Nelson, so Full Nelson kind of rides right there in the middle. If anything, I would say it's closer to an IPA. Um, but it's, uh, the idea is to have a, a hop forward beer. So a beer that really brings out the characteristics of the, the citrus, the pine uh, from the hops, as well as having that underlying bitterness. Uh, but it's not supposed to be so bitter that you wouldn't want to have a second one, we'll say, you know. So uh, for a lot of folks that don't like IPAs, Full Nelson tends to be um, a good compromise. You know, it's something that uh, my mom, who doesn't drink IPAs, will drink Full Nelson. So it's a good six pack for me to bring home when I'm, I'm in the mood for an IPA. Um, but it is, uh, it, is, it is our namesake. So it's a, a full flavored beer from Nelson County, we say, but, um, and it really, the, the graphics, the artwork really captures, we're hoping to capture just what we like to do out here in, in Nelson and out here at the brewery, just relaxing. Um, looking at the mountains and uh, we don't have any pictures of pizza in there, but we like to, we like to eat pizza out here too. So, <laughs> um, it, this one, it's, uh, it's, it's got a little, like I said, a little more flavor than the Kolsch. So it, it's, it's definitely um, it, it, you know, someone that enjoys more bitter beer uh, and it tends to go better with a little, a little bit of a stronger food. I really like it with spicy food, uh, uh. Or something like a really bold uh, burger uh, more or something along those lines. So, yeah, I was going to ask what, um, you might, what you might eat with it, pair with it. Um, yes, I love, you've got, as you mentioned before, I can see that little hops, that little hops flower, I think, sitting in the chair. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are the hops, are they grown there it, in your, opera? I mean, how do you guys? Yeah, so it's, uh, so we're sourcing hops from all over the world. Um, we talk about hops a lot like vintners talk about their grapes. Um, and hops, uh, depending on the type of hop and uh, where it's grown, um, have different flavors. So there are over a hundred different varietals of hops in the world and uh, they're very specific to certain geographies. For instance, the Kolsch we just had has a lot of uh, Central European hops, uh, yeah. German hops that, are, that make part of, part of what makes it that style, the Hallertau hops or the German traditional hops. Uh, this beer, uh, the Full Nelson, um, has a lot of Cascade and Centennial, uh, which are actually two of the dozen or so types of hops that you can actually, that you can grow in Virginia. Um, and so out here at the brewery uh, and down at our production location, the, the Barrel House, we have hop fields uh, where we grow um, Cascade hops. Uh, so every year we, um, we have volunteers come out, we, we cut these vines down. Uh, they grow up to be about uh, 20, 30 feet tall up in the air. They start in the ground as rhizomes. You can kind of see behind the, the ones that are growing there and then they, they crawl all the way up a string. Uh, and then we pick off the flowers and we use them for a, a wet hopped beer, but then we also save some throughout the year for full Nelson. So I think the next slide has kind of a more of a close up of what a ah, hop flower yeah. looks like. Um, we don't keep the leaves. We don't keep the, uh, the vine there. It's really just, we're just after that flower. Um, it looks like a little, a little cone. And uh, that's what, that's what a hop is. So we, um, while for a lot of our beers, we're using uh, pelletized uh, vacuum sealed hops from around the world for Full Nelson and a couple of, uh, one other beer we make during the year, we're able to actually use fresh, fresh hops for that one. So, you know, grown in and celebrating Virginia. That's- Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, when we first opened, um, there were very few breweries in like a, in a rural area. And uh, folks were telling our, our owner, like, why would you open up in the middle of nowhere? Nobody's gonna show up to your brewery. Mm. You know, it's more, it should be more of an urban setting. Uh, but it makes, to him, it made a lot of sense to really get in touch with the, the agricultural roots of brewing, um, the hops and uh, the, um, the, the grains that are grown out in the area and the, and the water and, and that sort of thing. Um, Hollis, we're getting a question. What is the yeah. other beer besides uh, Full Nelson that you use hops from VA? Yeah, so uh, we make a beer at the brew pub uh, called Hop Tub. Um, it is a beer that is made exclusively with these fresh hops. Uh, we usually bring some up from the barrel house as well. And um, 
we just we make that beer exclusively with the fresh hops it's called a wet hopped beer so we call it hop tub kind of a hot pun hot tub hop tub um and it's uh it, it has a really unique flavor to it because the hops aren't aren't dried out before they're used for the brewing so it really has like a fresh grass grassy flavor to it uh for full nelson we, the hops that we grow for full nelson um we can't grow nearly enough hops we might even I don't even know if we know it, grow enough to brew one batch. We're brewing dozens of batches a year. Hmm. Uh, so we, we kind of save handfuls of it to add to each batch more for sentimental purpose. Um, whereas the hot tub is made exclusively with these wet hops. I see. Okay. So full Nelson is you're just, you're, you're adding that ingredient to sort of imbibe yeah. that beer with that Nelson, Nelson County character, but it's right, not right, necessary. Right. But primarily the hops for that are coming from Oregon and, and Washington, which is the, yeah. you know, I think something like 95 plus percent of all hops grown in the U.S. are coming from Oregon and Washington. They just have the right climate for it. Okay. Um, yeah, hop tub is that other, is the fresh hop or wet hop beer. And so what time of the year is that available then? Because you're not brewing it. Yeah, so we do uh, we do the hop harvest in middle of August. We brew the beer in the middle of August, so probably mid to late September, the beer hits the hits the taps, and then we'll have it on tap uh, usually the rest of September and into October. Oh, okay, okay. Well, well, summertime in the fall then. That's good. Um, well, great. Um, I am gonna mention a couple of pieces of art now as people are enjoying their full Nelson, and feel free to as you're as you're tasting that if you have any. Thoughts about that? There you go. If you have any thoughts about that? Do do throw it in the chat. That looks great. Um, and uh, I have to say, so as soon as I saw, um, and I confess, this wasn't my first viewing of the full Nelson packaging. It's a it's a frequent visitor to our fridge. Um, my husband likes it quite a bit. So, um, but that packaging, you know, really brings to mind these two paintings in terms of this show, this exhibition. Um, you know, just on the surface that, that the coloring and the layout where you've got that vibrant blue against green and there's some yellow mixed in there, particularly with the, the David Johnson painting that's on our left um, and is coming to the show from the Rinalda House Museum or House Museum of American Art in um, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And then um, the Joshua Shaw that's part of the BMFA's own collection, this, wonderful little oil on paper um, that's on the right. And um, they, of course, also both have those, you know, mountains in the background, those fabulous Blue Ridge Mountains that are shown on your logo. Um, and I'm also thinking of the images that you showed us earlier um, of the brewery itself and really kind of what being in the shadow of those Blue Ridge mountains feels like, what that vibe is like, those environs. I mean, they're just, I'm sure anybody who's ever been out there can, can you know, identify how, how gorgeous they are and kind of um, that calm they bring as you're, as you're sitting with them. And um, I think, you know, your, the way, the way your brew pub and the way your operation is situated, the way you've kind of established that sort of vibe there, um, that you've really captured, you know, Nelson County in this area in, in a beer. And I think these artists are sort of similarly after something. Um, and it actually kind of puts me in mind of this, the type, the Arcadia and the title, this kind of reassuring and sort of calm majesty of those mountains um, with us. Um, and so, but it's interesting, this sort of real different perspectives we've got here, the sort of different points of view capturing that that kind of um, feeling of this, this particular landscape. So Johnson, of course, is showing us natural bridges, just a single element in this much broader um, landscape. And he even gives us like a little hint. I don't know if you guys can quite see it on just to the left of the bridge. Um, you kind of get an idea that this is becoming at this point in 1860, kind of a, a burgeoning tourist attraction. You see a little local inn and tavern right there to the left of the bridge. And then <clears throat> the Joshua Shaw on the right, um, you know, really different. I don't think if you came upon this painting, you might not even realize that Natural Bridge is involved uh, unless you read the title, because um, he's really zooming in and we're right at the top of that arch. And he's really much more focused on showing us 
again, that, that vista, those blue mountains in the background, you've got that green kind of pulling across like you have on your label and then um, the beautiful yellow ochre color of the arch itself. And um, what's interesting is, so Shaw is um, kind of putting us at the top of the arch and we're sort of imagining what it would feel like to look at like that little guy there. He's kind of peering over the edge. And um, this is very much kind of hearkening back to Thomas Jefferson's ownership of the bridge and his sort of promotion of the bridge. Um, Jefferson writes in his notes on the state of Virginia, which he publishes in 1785, so, so well before this, but um, he talks about the experience of coming up just to the edge of Natural Bridge. And, and he writes, um, you involuntarily fall on your hands and feet, you creep to the parapet and peep over it. And it's impossible for the emotions arising from the sublime to be felt beyond what they are here. So beautiful an arch, so elevated, so light, so springing as it were up to heaven. The rapture of the spectator is really indescribable. So again, really trying to capture this sense of place um, is something that artists do all the time. And it's, it's just really cool to hear of a brew prop trying to do it in a beer, it's awesome. So um, I think we've got, uh, one more beer, unless anybody else has any observations about these pieces or questions about the, the full Nelson itself, we can move on to explore our next beer, which is... I really like the one, the picture from the top, the top of the arch. That's a neat perspective. Right? It is. Yeah. It's, it's just very different. Um, do you think... <laughs> Uh, someone is asking, do you think TJ was having a beer when he wrote that smiley face? I mean, he, he, he may well have. I, I know that Jefferson himself was uh, experimented with brewing um, beer. So one could imagine that's quite possible. And did some of the first hops in Virginia as well. If I, I don't know if that's true. I remember somebody mentioning that. But yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Charleville, so I, I get a lot of Thomas Jefferson facts and we have to kind of. I bet you do. <laughs> true or not he's kind of a hero in the area that's why <laughs> yeah i'm sure some of them may be apocryphal but they yeah um the mat for the joshua shaw looks like it has been in the attic for a while <laughs> why not a new one um i will tell you let me see if i can scooch back to that I'm not oops i'm going forward um so that's the the image is actually painted on paper so it's not that it's in a mat it's um I think that's probably the paper itself that you're asking about, Eileen. And when this is um, shown in the galleries, you don't see that. You really see just the image, the way it appears, the way it's framed. Um, just that oil painting is is visible. Um, so good question. So that's that's sort of a well earned age on that, on that paper since it's from 1820. But I assure you, it's well cared for. <laughs> um, okay. So move us on to snow day. Yeah, so uh, Snow Day, man, I, I love this beer. So we, um, this is a, a barrel age beer, which I could, I could stand here and we could do a six day long webinar talking about barrel aged beer because I get really excited about it. So I'm trying to, try to contain myself here. But, no, it's okay. Uh, we, have a, we have a decent amount of time left. So yeah, okay, well, Take what you need. Here, <laughs> <laughs> um, this is actually the first year we've done, we've put Snow Day out. In this form, we did a, a really limited, rare release of a, a beer um, that was called Snow Day. That was aged for longer. And it had it had more ingredients in it, and this is kind of our, our beer for the market, Snow Day. Um, but this is uh, it's it's a it's part of a seasonal lineup. Um, in addition to the the Kolsch and Full Nelson, which we make year round, uh, we also have two seasonal lines. Uh, we have four beers that we do in six packs, and then we have four beers we do in four packs. Uh, and anything that's coming from us in a four pack um, is a barrel aged beer. Uh, so we uh, boast a, uh, a very, very large barrel aging program at the Blue Mountain Barrel House. I think um, if you want to flip to the next picture, we can flip yeah. back. But I'm just kind of showing you what I mean by it. It's uh, aging in bourbon barrels, um, hence the name Barrel House. Uh, mm -hmm. Our brewmaster, Taylor Smack, who started Blue Mountain in 2007, uh, put his first beer in a barrel, and I want to say 2000 nine or so um, with the beer called uh, Dark Hollow. So y'all may have uh, seen Dark Hollow before. You may have had Dark Hollow before. It's the, one of the longest brew. It was the first uh, Virginia made 
uh, barrel aged stout and it's the only one that's brewed all year long. So it's a good chance you've seen or had it if you're a fan of uh, big dark beers there. Um, it also has kind of a archway yeah. to it and kind of a <laughs> And correct me if I'm wrong, that's, that's in response to another geological feature of the area. Is that right? That, that yeah, so this, uh, the Dark Hollow is actually, um, this archway here is, is modeled after the, the Crozet Tunnel um, mm -hmm. that connects Crozet to Waynesburg. It's directly under the Blue Ridge Mountains uh, where Afton, where the Afton passes, where Route 64, Highway 64 goes over the mountains, the uh, Crozet Tunnel goes under the mountains. Um, and this, this is, I believe, trains used to go through it. And it's, I think, just opened back up recently for tours. Oh. And I think you can walk from one side to the other. It's like 20 miles long or something crazy like that. Huh. Um, anyway, so that's uh, our, our local archway. Uh, not quite as natural, but built into a natural feature. So. Sure. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so we have a big barrel aging program. We source our barrels, thanks, Roger, um, from directly from Kentucky, so from um, we have a broker that works in Kentucky and sources them from multiple distilleries. So it kind of depends on uh, the batch that comes in. We get about 250 bourbon barrels at a time. Um, I'm sorry, probably, but we can fit 250. I think we usually get about 100 at a time. Um, right now, I, the last time I was in the barrel room, I was seeing Four Roses, Wild Turkey, and uh, uh, Buffalo Trace action. It's actually easier for us to get Buffalo Trace barrels than it is for the rest of us to get Buffalo Trace bottles from the, the ABC store. If you chase bourbon um but so yeah so we're sourcing uh barrels from from various distilleries uh i think we've had some blantons and woodford reserve mm -hmm. barrels roll through as well uh right now we're going through about two thousand bourbon barrels a year so we uh, we have a special room that's where the barrels are there uh it's climate controlled so we control the temperature um not too cold but not too warm we actually kind of fluctuate the temperature a little bit to help uh, expand the wood on the barrel uh, and then kind of compress the wood to really squeeze the bourbon flavor out and get the, the beer flowing through the wood uh, there and aging it. So the, the, the Dark Hollow and the Snow Day, um, the, the Snow Day is kind of a seasonal version of Dark Hollow. Dark Hollow is our 10% uh, stout that we, um, we produce year round, whereas the Snow Day is, is uh, we're adding, uh, well, we'll, the different ingredients to it to make it a, a more seasonal beer. So. Uh, we actually, we used to use the barrels um, multiple times. Thanks for the question, Martha. Um, we used to uh, reuse them for different beers, but we started having issues with uh, infection or some wild yeast or bacteria kind of sticking behind and, and turning the beer sour. Uh, so we do a single use only. We also get better bourbon flavor that way. Um, so after it's aged in the barrels, uh, we pull the beer out and then we uh, just take the barrels outside and we place them outside in the field and then we, we sell them. So uh, I think right now we're selling a barrel, a used bourbon barrel um, for about, I wanna say like $60 or so there at the barrel house and people can uh, pick them up. And, and we, we also sell them to landscapers and that sort of thing. They use them for decorations and weddings and things like that. So. I have a question just, yeah. do, you, do you, and maybe this is, there's not a significant difference in kind of what, what the barrels can give the beer depending on where they're from but do you ever notice the slight difference in taste or a difference different aspect depending on where they're sourced from yeah so i've never been able to personally or talk to anybody in the brewery that's able to kind of correlate certain barrels with certain distilleries or anything like that we also blend um okay. so if you, you know we'll take about 40 to 50 bourbon barrels blend them all together um and then we bottle out of that uh, so that okay. kind of homogenizes everything yeah. um but uh, you know we, beer has a does have variation and sometimes if they're uh they could have more bourbon flavor less bourbon flavor sometimes the beer will come out a little richer um and for the the dark hollow and for the snow day uh, we spend about 100 days in bourbon barrels uh Catherine, thanks for the question um a lot of interest so. in these barrels <laughs> yeah well it's the it's the neatest thing and it and that's why i get so excited about it and it's something that not too many breweries have, have been able to invest in and have the space dedicated to. So we're, we take a lot of pride in it. Um, our brewmaster, Taylor Smack, who started Blue Mountain uh, back in 2007, his very, he, uh, he was actually working in Charlottesville for a local magazine. Uh, it was English, he was an English major at Hampton Sydney down uh, in Farmville. Um, and he uh, started in, or I guess apprenticing and shadowing at South Street Brewery. And once he kind of gained a love for brewing, he decided, all right, this is what I want to do. So he went, to, went out to Chicago, went to uh, 
Siebel Institute, got a brewing degree, and then worked for Goose Island. So it's uh, who were the first ones to make a bourbon barrel aged beer in the country or as far as anybody knows oh, wow. uh, with a beer called Bourbon County. And that right. comes out every year on, uh, in November around Black Friday. Um, so he brought that experience back to Virginia um, and, and started doing barrel aged beer here in Virginia with Fifty Nine. Oh, that's so, really, I think uh, uh, Kathy just yeah, noticed. It's rambling away. <laughs> okay, yes, it is delicious. And I'll, and I'll tell you, but we'll talk about Snow Day now. So uh, yeah. we can just go back to the slide and then not that y'all have the beer in your hand, you know what it looks like, but, um, but anyway, so we, we've done a lot of different burn barrel aged beers. Um, and this one is essentially our uh, Dark Hollow, which is, I said, the one we make year round, the very first one we ever did, uh, the most prolific barrel aged beer in Virginia. Um, this is a variant on that. So we take that beer and then uh, we leave it in the barrel and we're adding cinnamon, uh, cardamom, uh, chili, cocoa nibs and vanilla all into the barrel and letting it age with that. Uh, what comes out is what we like to call kind of a Mexican hot chocolate stout. Um, it's got a lot of great cinnamon and cardamom flavor to it. Uh, the chocolate flavor uh, really just kind of accentuates the underlying chocolate and coffee flavors that already are there. Um, a big stout like this or a big stout like Dark Hollow because of the, the highly roasted barley, much like you roast coffee beans, uh -huh. uh, the roasted barley gives a lot of flavor of cocoa and uh, dark chocolate and, and coffee, but then everything that we're adding to it complements that. So um, this is, our, like I said, our first year putting it out. This one's a little harder to find. Uh, the Costco's, um, Total Wine and Wegman should have this one as well as a few local independent bottle shops as well. Um, and then we still have a handful of uh, cases left here at the brewery, but um, yeah. Uh, Brenda, I'd say it is, it is, I would say a lot more complex in a lot of ways, just be, between that cinnamon and cardamom. Uh, the base beer itself, you know, I'll let you guys know it, it is dark hollow, but adding the other elements to it does kind of take it to the next level and really makes it a great winter beer. So. Yeah, it, I had a little taste earlier. It is yummy. And I'm yeah, it's, it's neat because it's also, uh, it's just so different. You know, we, yeah. we started with the, the Kolsch, which was, you know, tastes like beer. <laughs> right, it tastes right, just right. like you would think of when you think of the taste of beer. Um, and then the full Nelson being, a, you know, more of like an IPA, what you think of when you think of craft beer. And then uh, the dark, the snow day and the dark hollow, it's, it's a whole nother tier, I, I feel like. And um, it's it tastes less like beer, more like a cocktail or almost more like drinking a really complex red wine. And you drink it the same way, you know, you pour it in a smaller glass, you're sipping on it. It's yeah. twice the strength of your average beer. So it, it's a whole different kind of, ex of experience. Yeah, and I and I I think um, you know this this a lot, I hear a lot of what you're saying. This idea of experience, this idea of sort of an experience for your senses, and the the depth of it, the quality of it, the complexity of it. Um, and I'm also really hearing a lot of reverence for and appreciation for the the real science behind making this beer, um, the way in which, you know, your, your brewmaster is sort of really experimenting. I mean, it's kind of interesting to hear what you guys are noticing about, we can, you know, we can't use the barrels twice because this will happen. And, um, right. or we, we learn the whole way. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, yeah. that's, that's what science is. It's really kind of um, looking for and experimenting with um, all those different nuances that you might not notice. And, yeah. um, I'd argue that um, if we can move to the next work of art, let me do that. I'd argue that kind of the artist of this work of art would equally appreciate that approach, that sort of um, interest in, in um, building complexity and that um, reverence for science and an understanding or a looking for the understanding of how all these diverse elements, those really exotic flavors and all those different ingredients are working on, on top of the dark hollow to produce this really extraordinary um, taste of snow day. Um, now I, I am not a scholar of Frederick Church. I don't know if he was in fact a beer drinker. Uh, if anybody does, feel free to put it in the chat, but I do feel like he would appreciate how this beer was made. Um, and this particular image from the exhibition is a, is a good example because it is nothing if not complex. Um, 
there's a lot happening here. This is not owned by the VMFA. It actually um, is from the Franklin Museum of Art at the University of Virginia. So, um, you know, kind of not, not too far away from, from you guys or Natural Bridge either um, for its home. Um, and it's made by uh, Frederick Edwin Church, who as um, I'm, I'm recognizing a few names in the chat who probably are quite familiar with this artist. Um, and that he's a central figure uh, in the Hudson River School of Landscape Painters. Um, and he's also you know, quite a traveler. And in 1851, came to Virginia, um, you know, traveled through Virginia and, and, and spent some time at Natural Bridge, really studying it and sketching it. And the resulting painting from this visit is really quite layered in what's presented here. Um, you, of course, you see the bridge, and um, I don't know if, if you recall that slide from before. We had those three other views. You know, this one, if you were to characterize it, it is just um, really almost just rendered with absolute scientific precision. It's just incredible in the in the amount of um, detail and and every single aspect of the bridge is sort of portrayed here. But you also have um, a couple of little figures down here, um, kind of the very base of the bridge, just there on the, the edge of Cedar Creek. And if I zoom into them a little bit, you can see them a little, a little closer. And you've got an African-American guide speaking with a visitor. Her, her back is to the bridge, but he's speaking about the bridge. And um, Church is somebody who, who doesn't, I like the scale that the figures give to the bridge. Yes, Roger, that's true. And I think I was just about to say, Church doesn't place anything in his painting without a reason. And it, it is probably quite true that they are there to help indicate the scale of the bridge, but there's also more going on here. Um, Church is someone who's, who's often um, imbibed some history and is interested in, in speaking to historical moments in his paintings as well. And here you've got this African-American guide speaking to this person. He's pointing up to the arch. And I don't know if you can see that where he's pointing kind of at the top of the arch is a little indication of like a little, a little fence um, where in fact the great wagon route is kind of running along the arch. It's sort of a gateway to the West, if you will, um, at this time. It's currently route, US Route 11. Um, so it's still a road, it still can be traveled. Um, but this, this man we think um, may be or refer to, I shouldn't say we think, I, scholars think, I, I'm just learning about this, um, refers to a gentleman named Patrick Henry who was in fact a, a freed enslaved person in Thomas Jefferson's employ for quite a long time at the bridge as a guide for visitors. You know, remember Thomas Jefferson is really promoting this as a place for people to come and visit. Um, he wants people to come and, um, and see it almost as a, as a tourist attraction, um, but really more than that, sort of celebrating the, the landscape and the grandeur of the American um, landscape. But um, when church, um, Someone's asking a question. Kelly, I don't think we got quite got that whole question. So type, I think I've got, do you think? Um, but Church at this point um, would not have understood that Patrick Henry was a freed enslaved person. This, this was not really known till much, much, much later. Um, in 1851, when Church visited the bridge, Patrick Henry had been deceased for about 20 years, but um, he, um, the story was, would still have been that he was an enslaved person. And the exhibition really kind of addresses this dynamic. There are many sketches that Church produced in preparation for this painting. And in, it really kind of explores this idea that perhaps Church may have meant for this painting to be um, kind of a a subtle or indicating sort of a subtle uh, disapproval 
of, yes, do you think church was making a political statement? Yes, that is the thought. I was just about to say um, a bit of a, a subtle disapproval at um, the sort of unchecked expansion of slavery at this time. Um, you know, it's just the, the compromise of 1850 has just been passed. Um, so that, that indeed, Kelly, is, is quite likely what's going on. And the exhibition kind of really explores that dynamic. And as I said, um, the, the scientific kind of precision, this, this idea that church really would have appreciated the way this beer was made. Um, he was also a follower of the German naturalist, Alexander Humboldt. Um, and so you see in that Alexander sort of Humboldt sort of, um, he was a bit of a superstar <laughs> back in his time in the 19th century. And he uh, was known as a world traveler, um, a philosopher, a writer, kind of a Renaissance man. And, um, but he to some of his writings where he really sought to um, kind of unify the branches of scientific knowledge and culture. And so he's kind of, um, mm -hmm he's sort of promoting the idea that to understand the nature and the universe, scientists need to embrace the sort of aesthetic power of the world and artists on the other hand, really need to look at it with a scientific eye. And that indeed is what church does. And um, he, in fact, I'm showing you here, this is not in the exhibition, but it is um, a piece, a gorgeous piece by Church that the BMFA um, owns, and you, it it is in South America. Um, Alexander uh, Humboldt moves or sort of uh, takes a trip down to um, through Colombia and Ecuador and um, through this through South America. Um, Frederick Church reads Humboldt's writings. Um, in fact, his treatise, Co treatise Cosmos, a sketch of the physical description of the universe. And he's also inspired to um, travel. And he goes down in 1853 and takes a trip through Colombia and Ecuador. And you might be asking like, why am I showing you a picture of Colombia um, in relation to a beer that's entitled Snow Day? Um, but uh, really it's just to sort of, um, give you an idea of just the idea of kind of what kind of magic can happen when you combine the right elements together. So Church, again, he's taking that same scientific kind of approach to rendering this place. And this isn't a, an exact spot on the Magdalena River. It's in fact kind of a pastiche, kind of a combination of, um, you know, river, uh, of grasslands, of exotic mm -hmm. plants that he's observed, and of course that mountain range, um, that South American mountain range in the back. So I'll leave you with that. It's a it's a blue mountain, so why not? Uh, with snow and, on top, right? <laughs> and snow on top. Yes, exactly. So um, that kind of wraps up the art we have, um, and I hope it has sort of wet your appetite. This small taste of art. Um, from this exhibition has whet your appetite to maybe come and explore it when it goes on view in February. Um, and I should mention too that when it does, it's going to be open February 6th uh, through August 1st. And there is mm -hmm. um, a talk by Dr. Chris mm -hmm. Oliver, our assistant curator of American Art, um, who has done a phenomenal job on the show. I just, I cannot wait to get in and see all these pieces together. Um, I heard Chris speak about this. He's wonderful to listen to. Um, and he will be visiting um, the themes that are um, addressed in the show and much more of the art. And he has mm -hmm. much better things to say about it than I. So I would encourage you to attend that free, um, regist register for that free talk. Um, and um, I should also mention, just as we're as we're wrapping up, um, and before I get a chance to thank Hollis profusely for this this great evening, um, that we've got a um, the next taste of art. We're going back to wine on February twelfth, um, and this will be a really exciting one because we've got um, 
Bill Long, who is actually the president of the Association of African American Vintners, um, and he's also Longevity's founder, um, Longevity Winery out in California. So he's going to be joining us for that um, Taste of Art on February 12th. Um, and so I encourage everyone to join us for that as well. So I've got to thank you both. Great learning about the art and the beer. Cheers. Yes, cheers. Um, I think Ms. Catherine asked us a question a few minutes yeah. ago about beer being better I'll from a that. Yeah, bottle. that's a good question. Um, it's a fun question. And it's a, it's a good one because beer is uh, rapidly moving almost exclusively to cans. Um, mm -hmm. Most craft breweries open up now are uh, packaging exclusively in cans. They're a little cheaper to get started up with. Um, and it just seems to be the way that craft beer is headed. You can fit more on the shelf and everything. Um, as far as what's better, uh, I, I, I think it's a preference. Um, they say that cans are better in that uh, they completely block light. So light UV rays can impact the flavors of beer. Um, and a can, which is, is completely opaque, would block entirely. That's why uh, beer bottles are brown, is to block out as much mm -hmm. light as possible. Um, I also personally like cans because they're lighter, they're smaller, you can fit more in a cooler, and they don't break. Um, but there's also something to be said, you know, about drinking beer straight from the bottle and that experience. Uh, they say the best thing for drinking craft beer to like best appreciate craft beer is to pour it into a glass. So at that point, I guess it doesn't really matter as much. Um, but I think the science and the, the UV rays say cans for sure. So. Ah, okay. That's a great question. Very interesting. Cans, somebody is saying cans. Yeah. <laughs> Echoing well, I think initially when cans first started being used to package beer, uh, they it would give flavors, all flavors of, of like a kind of metallic flavor. Uh, mm -hmm. But cans have a super light coating now on the inside that kind of that protects the uh, protects the beer from the metal. So uh, it's turned into a metallic taste. Very good, very yeah. good. Well, Hollis, <laughs> I can't thank you enough. This was so fun, and I learned a lot. And I have now to finish the rest of my snow day. So this is really guys. good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I was really excited to be a part of it. And, um, we'll have to come see the museum here soon. Yeah. And I, the brewery, yes. <laughs> Especially now, it's both both places, I should add, are very good places to go at this time. Because as you mentioned, um, the brewery's out, you have a lot of outside seating. It's, it's safe and sound to be there, as is the museum. We're open and um, one only show up with a mask. Uh, so come, enjoy the show and maybe stop at uh, the cafe and enjoy a full Nelson while you're there. Yeah, or a... yeah perfect. All right, well, thank you all very, very much. And I should mention as we get off, uh, don't forget to, if you, if you can, go ahead and um, respond to the survey if you see one pop up. So I'm going to wrap us up and say good night to all and happy weekend. Cheers. Bye-bye, <laughs> cheers. <laughs>